Hello, I'm Sergeant First Class Thomas Enochian, and this is the mallet portion of our video. This section will cover various techniques used on keyboard instruments. I will cover the five primary mallet instruments used in both concert band and orchestral repertoire, the marimba, xylophone, chimes, vibraphone, and bells. The marimba is the perfect instrument to start with. First, it has the largest octave range of any keyboard instrument, and second, it can be used to demonstrate both two and four mallet technique. And finally, since it is the largest of the keyboard instruments, you will find that it is much easier to transfer the skills discussed from a larger to a smaller keyboard instrument. Let's begin our marimba discussion with the understanding that you, the student, can read both treble and bass clef. If there is any doubt in your mind that you do not have this skill, please speak with your music director. And to the music directors watching, I strongly encourage you to teach your percussion students from a very early age the ability to read notes and rhythms. Remember that if you start training your percussion students from a very early age to become complete musicians, the results for you and your ensemble will be well worth the effort. The marimba is made of rosewood or synthetic bars and aluminum or brass resonators. The instrument has a range from four to five octaves. Since the sound we produce on all percussion instruments is a result of the mallet or stick we choose and the way we strike the instrument, let's begin with mallet selection. Most of our mallet choices for the marimba are going to consist of varying grades of yarn or rubber, and the shaft is generally either rattan or birch. Never use plastic or brass mallets on the marimba you will damage the bars. Once we have determined which mallets to use, let's discuss how to hold the mallets. The grip we use is similar to match grip on snare drum. We hold the mallets loosely between the thumb and first joint of the index finger to create our fulcrum. Let the other three fingers wrap around the mallet lightly, not to inhibit the movement of the mallet. Remember that everyone's hand and finger sizes are very different and you may find that you have to adjust your fulcrum to meet the needs of your hand. Face your palms downward and make sure that both your left and right hand have an identical grip. Although the keyboard grip is similar to snare drum, the striking response is very different. On snare drum, the tension of the head will allow the stick to rebound to its starting point, but on the keyboard, there is little to no rebound. In order to get the mallet back to the starting point, we must use our wrist. Since there is no rebound, wrist strokes are essential to great two mallet keyboard playing. Practice all your major scales in one or two octaves, or use the whole range of the instrument, especially when working with the marimba. This will allow you to work on moving up and down the instrument and on shuffling your feet. You want to familiarize yourself with the location of every bar and accustom yourself to the wide range of the instrument. Here are some examples. Scales don't always have to start at the bottom and go up. You can start at the top and come down. Listen. To add a variety to your warm-ups, you can play scales in different rhythms. Listen to this example. You really know your scales when you can go through them continually without stopping. Check this out. You can extend your warm-ups to include thirds and arpeggios. As you increase the speed of an exercise, lower your mallet to about an inch from the bar. This minimizes the distance between the mallet and the bar and increases your accuracy. Also shift from playing accidental slightly off center to playing on the end of the bar that is located directly above the natural notes.
Now that we have developed some basic two mallet skills, let's cover one more topic before we move on to four mallet playing. Let's discuss how and why we perform rolls. Rolls on percussion instruments are used to sustain the note. Percussionists do not have the same ability as brass or woodwind players to extend the length of sound by allowing air to pass through our instrument. So we replace the air circulation with an alternating hand movement known as a roll to sustain the sound of an instrument. Place your right mallet off center closer to your body side of the bar and hold your left mallet horizontal to your right mallet slightly off center closer to the accidental side of the bar and alternate moving your mallets. Strive for a roll speed that will allow you to sustain the pitch while working for a consistent sound between your hands. This is known as a single stroke roll and this technique can be used to roll on all the keyboard instruments. Practice your major scales with a solid roll to connect all the notes and then a slightly separated roll between notes. Now that we have talked about the techniques for two mallets, let's continue our conversation and discuss the four mallet technique. There are other four mallet techniques, but the most common is called the Stevens grip. I find that with most of the four mallet parts that you will encounter throughout your band and orchestra experience, the Stevens grip will provide you with the maximum ability to expand and contract your mallets. Let's begin with how we hold the mallets. For an excellent explanation of how we hold four mallets, I will paraphrase the instruction from the Lee Howard Stevens book, Method of Movement for the Marimba. Begin by holding out the right hand as if you were going to shake someone's hand. Place the base of the inside right mallet underneath the muscle of the thumb and allow it to rest on the index finger close to the third joint. Without any tension or constraint, the mallet should balance with the leverage between the base of the thumb and the index finger. Now for the outside mallet. In the right hand, place the mallet between the middle and the ring finger. Next, bring the ring and pinky fingers around the mallet to secure it with the fingers. Adjust the mallet until the end of the shaft is sticking a quarter of an inch out from the pinky finger and edge of the hand. Check to see that the mallet is tucked in the curve of the second joint of the ring finger and is slightly above the second joint of the middle finger. It is important that you keep from choking up on the shaft of the mallet with the back two fingers. This is a very common mistake. Gripping close to the end allows the stick to be used to its maximum potential. Careful attention to the details in the beginning stages of holding four mallets will save you and your teacher much pain and suffering. Now let's see if we can put both mallets in one hand at the same time. Begin by placing the outside mallet between your middle and ring finger. Then add the inside mallet between the thumb and index finger. Avoid pinching or squeezing the mallet with your fingers. This produces excess tension in the hand. Also avoid letting the thumb curl up. Try to have the largest surface of the thumb rather than just the tip on the mallet. Without the proper hand position, you will limit your ability to expand and contract your mallets. Finally, repeat this process in your left hand. If you are right-handed, you might need to spend more time getting the grip with your left hand. We have concentrated on two and four mallet techniques for the marimba. Remember that you can apply the same skills you've just learned to all your keyboard instruments. Welcome to the xylophone portion of this video. For a detailed description of two and four mallet techniques, refer to the marimba instruction. Before we can begin playing the xylophone, let's determine the type of sound we want and choose a mallet that will give us that sound. Most of our mallet selection for this keyboard instrument will consist of different weighted plastic head mallets. Listen to the tone change as I move from a light weighted plastic mallet to a heavier weighted plastic head mallet.
If you don't have a marimba, you can substitute a xylophone and use yarn or rubber mallets for a similar sound. Remember to grip the mallet between the thumb and first joint of your index finger and curl the rest of your fingers lightly around the mallet shaft. And don't forget to use single strokes to roll on the xylophone. Let the speed of the music or exercise determine whether or not you strike the accidental notes over the end or slightly off center of the bars. This excerpt is from the xylophone part to Ein Folkfest. Listen and watch as I move back and forth from the center and ends of the accidental bars where I feel it necessary. For the purpose of this video, I have used plastic mounts to demonstrate various techniques. However, I strongly encourage all of you to go ahead and use rubber or yarn mallets when practicing your parts and exercises. This will help you to avoid permanent hearing damage. Another topic we should consider on all keyboard instruments is sight reading. Let's discuss some practice techniques that will help us to become better sight readers. First is observation. Look at everything other than the pitches, key signature, time signature, tempo, and dynamics. Then we establish our range, lowest to highest pitch of the piece, and play the scale of the work in that range. Now look for accidentals that occur often, but are not in the key signature, and play your scale to include these pitches. Next is tempo. Based on the most demanding rhythmic passage, choose a tempo and stick with it. We then look for familiar patterns such as scales or arpeggios. Next is direction. Always move in the direction of the music. Even if you are striking the wrong pitches, at least you are moving in the right direction. Remember, always look ahead. Your eyes should always be a beat or two ahead of your hands. Next, don't stop for any mistakes. If you stop to correct your mistake, you will have created a total of four mistakes the wrong note, loss of time, wrong rhythm, and you will be in the wrong place playing the wrong rhythm. Finally, try to play the right rhythms. Even if you hit the wrong pitches, you will maintain the time, stay with the ensemble, and get an idea of the piece. When you have completed the sight reading, go back and practice the passages that gave you the most problems and work them out slowly. A great way to challenge your sight reading is to play duets with someone who is a better reader than you. This could be with any instrument, not just percussion. Don't worry about trying to play the accidental notes slightly off center of the bar. First and foremost, your job is to get the part played without interfering with the written notes and rhythmic integrity of the music. Hello again. You caught me in the middle of practicing my chime part to the 1812 Overture. As you can see, the composer has left the interpretation of this part entirely up to the performer. The only way to make a mistake with this part is to forget when to come in or when to stop playing. When performing this piece, make sure you have hearing protection available. And most important, that contrary to your music director's opinion, this part is never loud enough. Now let's begin with the mallet selection. You may choose between a rawhide or a synthetic material. I prefer to use a chime mallet that has a hard and soft hammer on each side of the mallet. Push the pedal down with your foot and strike the chime note at the cap of the tube, horizontal to the tube. You can dampen the chime note by releasing the pedal or by muffling the note with your free hand. These are the basic techniques used to perform on this instrument. And yes, there are times when the melody of a piece can be sounded from the chimes. So I leave you now with the melody that resounds from the chimes during the march, Chimes of Liberty.
The vibraphone has four distinct features that separate its appearance from a xylophone and marimba. First, if we look at the bars on the vibraphone, we notice that they are metallic instead of wood. Second, you should notice that the accidental notes are the same height as the natural notes. Third, if you look right below the bars, just at the top of the resonators, you will notice little fans that are turned on and off and made faster or slower by a motor. Most vibe parts will indicate when the motor is used. If nothing is indicated in your part, then go ahead and play the vibes without the motor running. Finally, if we look toward the bottom of the instrument, you will notice that we have a pedal. Before we begin to play this instrument, we must first choose our mallets. This selection is usually going to consist of different grades of chord mallets. I will demonstrate the same passage with two mallets that differ in hardness. As you listen to the different mallets, be thinking about which mallets you would choose to play this passage. As a reminder, never use brass or plastic mallets on this instrument. After we select our mallets, the next important thing to know about the vibraphone is how and when to use the pedal. The pedal is used to release the bars from being dampened and adds length to the struck notes. Listen now as I play a scale with the pedal down. You will hear how all of the tones ring together. To stop the ringing of tones, I release the pedal. To stop a sustained tone without releasing the pedal, use your other mallet to dampen the sound by pressing the head of the mallet onto the bar. This technique will allow you to stop the sound of specific notes while the other tones ring through. Most of the time, the composer indicates what notes or phrases they want sustained, either by connecting a line over the notes or by writing the phrase, pedal down. Every now and then, you must decide how to interpret a part. Make sure that your interpretation complements what you hear in the music. Remember that as you play quick two mallet passages or very heavily scored four mallet chords, it is perfectly acceptable and even necessary to play the accidental notes on the end of the bar. In this passage, you can see and hear how moving the accidentals to the end of the bar enables us to execute this phrase more easily than trying to play all the accidentals in the center of the bar. It is rare to roll on a vibraphone, but in the event a roll is needed, remember to use the single stroke roll. The bells are the quintessential keyboard instrument. Like the Special Forces soldier, only through failure are you revealed. This is the keyboard instrument that will see the most action. Inaccuracy is unacceptable. Perfection is the ultimate goal. Watch and listen as our musician performs the most precarious bell part ever composed. Please give this performer your undivided attention. One mistake could cause this player great embarrassment and suffering, or even worse, prolong the rehearsal. Failure is not an option. We give you now the most infamous bell part from the concert band repertoire. Ladies and gentlemen, a B-flat octave. As you have just seen and heard, we went to great lengths to introduce the concert bells, which are sometimes referred to as the glockenspiel. We wanted to make the point that although practicing the larger keyboard instruments may be more fun, and although they allow for more solo literature, the majority of band and orchestral pieces will require you to spend most of your rehearsal time playing the bells.
Let's discuss the mallets and techniques that you will use when performing on this instrument. You may use brass or plastic mallets depending upon the piece you are performing, and you may even decide to switch between these mallets for different tonal effects. I tend to use the brass mallets for a more articulate and metallic sound. Remember that your thumb and the first joint of your index finger serve as your fulcrum. Lightly wrap your remaining fingers around the shaft of the mallet, face your palms down, and make sure that both your hands look identical. Since the size of the bells is much smaller than the other keyboard instruments, strike both natural notes and accidental notes in the center of the bar. Rarely will you have to play an accidental note on the end of the bar. Make sure you allow the mallet to rebound after striking the bar. Here is a demonstration of where the mallet should be striking both accidental and natural notes. Remember that consistency in striking area translates into consistency of sound. Dampening on the bells can be performed by using your free hand to muffle the sound, or your forearm when numerous notes must be muffled. Rolling on the bells can be a little tricky because of the small size of the bars. Remember to use single strokes. You will have to practice not only the rolling method as described in the marimba section, but also the method of alternating your mallets so that each mallet will strike in the same spot as the previous mallet. The latter technique gives us just a slightly more consistent sound and can be used when rolling on a single bell note for a long period of time. If this method feels awkward to your hands, then return to the first method of rolling on the bars. Remember that you want to make your hands feel comfortable as they play. I will close the mallet portion of this video by performing the melody from the Stars and Stripes Forever, the Sousa march that we use to close our concerts. Hello, I'm Sergeant First Class Scott Vincent, and welcome to the timpani portion of this video. In this section, we'll cover basic fundamental techniques and quite a few advanced techniques. You'll gain a comprehensive knowledge of how to play the timpani with a good quality tone and a full understanding of how and why the timpani work, mechanically speaking. I'll begin by saying that all too often, the timpani are conceived to be a loud and bombastic instrument with limited musical capabilities. Consider the history of the timpani in the settings of the early symphony. The timpani were, of course, utilized in a very rhythmical sense with wooden mallets being the most commonly used. Not much tone is compared with the modern timpani sound. The progression of sound of the modern day timpani has led us to a much warmer and resonant tone. As you watch this video, I hope that you, the student or teacher, will gain a much better appreciation of the musical possibilities of the timpani.
Let's begin by assuming, as in the keyboard section of this video, that you can already read in base clef. The first thing I would like to discuss is probably the most basic, yet the most ignored fundamental, the general setup of the timpani. First, in a basic set of timpani, there are four drums ranging in size from 32 inches to 23 inches in diameter. That's the most basic set. 32 inch, 29 inch, 26 inch, and 23 inches. The largest of the drums will be on the player's left, and the smallest will be on the player's right. Now set your body in position behind the two middle timpani, the 29 and the 26 inch, in such a way that you're most comfortable. Now with your eyes closed, move your right hand over to a comfortable playing position where the top drum would be. Open your eyes, and without removing your right hand from this position, pull the 23 inch drum into position. Now do the same thing for the 32 inch. And that's basically it. Now that you've got the timpani into position and ready to play, let's discuss the body position. And this is the section of the video where you may need to be most flexible in your thinking. Simply put, are you tall, short, or medium height? Either way, I recommend the sitting position. Now I sit all of the time. Actually, it's more like resting on the edge of, say, a 32 inch high stool. Now, by choosing to sit, there are quite a few advantages. First, it's more comfortable for a tall person to approach the timpani from this angle. as opposed to, say, this angle. Not to mention much better for the back. And second, sitting for anyone will allow you to facilitate pedaling changes much easier. Now you'll find that modern day writing for timpani requires many fast pitch changes, sometimes while simultaneously playing on another drum. And so for this reason, I sit. Now for those who choose to stand, I can only guess it's because they're vertically challenged. And I'll bet you when they play something that requires a lot of pedaling, they use a stool, which in turn proves my point. Sitting is the way to go. Now that we've got the drums into position and we're in a comfortable seated or standing position, let's discuss the grip. Basically, we've got three choices here, German, French, and the in-between stroke, American. A typical German style timpani grip will look somewhat similar to the snare drum grip, however have a little less pressure applied from the back fingers. The palm should face the floor and the fulcrum or pressure point will be between the thumb and the first or second joints of the index finger. There is also a similarity of wrist action to the snare drum stroke, typically a downward motion with that distinctive timpani lift. The nature of this grip is to provide a strong, weighty sound that'll cut through just about any size ensemble. Next, there's the French grip. With the fulcrum in the same place as the German grip, turn the hands outward about 90 degrees until the thumbs are facing upwards. This grip allows for a more light-handed stroke, allowing the sound to be drawn out of the head. Now everything in between these two grips is sort of an adaptation called the American grip. And I would say that this is probably the most commonly used grip. It's a good combination of a downward and upward motion allowing for optimum lift and a quality resonant tone. Now from the German grip, rotate your hands outward about 45 degrees instead of 90 degrees as in the French grip. And that's it. Now you're probably wondering, what grip do I use? Well, I use all three. It all depends on what's called for in the music. What's the style? How thick is the orchestration? What type of ensemble am I supporting? Or even, what type of venue am I playing? Now I'll get into more specifics later in the video when I cover mallet selection. Now let's take a look at the position of the mallet on the head. In the down position, the mallet should be parallel to the playing surface, and the playing area should be approximately three inches from the rim, or roughly one quarter the distance from the center of the drum. If you're not good with math, draw an imaginary line through the middle of the head, then again through that distance, and once more, there's your beating spot. 
Also, try to pick an area directly in between two tension rods. I tend to find that the drum is more resonant in between rods as opposed to in line with one, especially if the drum is out of clear. By out of clear, I mean when one or more tuning spots is not identical in tension. I guess in a perfect world, when the head is absolutely in tune, it may not matter. Before we get into stroke, let's discuss the different mallet types. There are two basic types, cartwheel and ball. Now the cartwheel from a top view looks sort of like a wheel and is nothing more than a piece of felt wrapped around a core and sewn together on the outside. Now the advantage, it's easier to wrap. Disadvantage, the seam is visible and audible. Now the ball stick is basically a parachute piece of felt laid over the core with the seam drawn around the shaft. Now the advantage, the seam is hidden and it lasts longer because of the ever-changing impact spots. Now the disadvantage, it's harder to wrap. Now since most of you watching this video won't end up wrapping your own mallets, I suggest using the ball type. Now those of you who opt for the cartwheel wrap, try marking the seam of the mallet with a black felt pen. This will make it easier to spot the seam, which you don't want to hit on, because you'll hear a ticking sound. Now, I would like to at some point get into the different types of shafts, but I think I'll tackle that later in the section on mallet selection. Let's now get into the real guts of this session, technique. If you haven't viewed the logistical section, it might be a good idea to look at the section on grip and playing area. I'd like to describe a good timpani stroke as one similar to a tennis ball rebounding from a downward toss. And with the mallets in a perpendicular position to the ground, strike the head imagining that tennis ball rebound. And you can achieve this by lifting the mallets high off the head immediately after impact, drawing the sound out. The technique just described is a very basic, general description of a proper timpani stroke. Within this, there are a few varieties that can really complement your arsenal of sounds. Or for legato sound, just leave the mallet on the head a little longer. And what you're after is a sound which is darker and more resonant, really pulling the sound deep from out of the drum, rather than that hard surface sound. Now for staccato, or more articulate sound, lift the mallet sooner. Now this would be a legato stroke which really pulls the sound out of the drum. Just a nice slow motion to and from the head. Now this would be a staccato stroke. Same speed exercise, just quicker motions off the head. Now you could use this if you needed to hear absolutely every note. All right, let's discuss dynamics for a minute. That's a huge misconception that for a louder sound, you need to hit the drum harder. Well, I guess when it comes down to it, that may be physically true. However, there is a better way to do it. The problem with telling someone to hit the drum harder for a louder sound is that they'll only increase the downward motion, choking off the head and creating a harsh, non-resonant sound. Instead, try using more height of rise before the actual downward motion. Let this be your method of volume. This next section will cover rolls, which I believe is one of the most challenging things to do well on timpani. I'll begin by saying that as in keyboard percussion playing, single stroke rolls are used exclusively. So it goes without saying that you must develop this skill before you'll be able to master rolling. Now here's an exercise I think that'll help you develop your single stroke roll. By the way, you can practice these on the pad or on the timpani themselves.
I should say that there is not just one speed of roll for the timpani. Now, the speed will be determined by the tension of the head that you're playing on. For example, if you're rolling on a D natural on the 26 inch drum, your roll should sound something like this. Now, on the other hand, if it's going to be a D on the 32 inch drum, it should look something like this. As you can see, the roll on the low drum seemed to be much slower. Well, it was. If I placed the same roll on a practice pad, it would sound like an eighth note warm-up. Well, however, that's all it takes. Now, the most important point to remember is that when beginning the roll, prepare both mallets so that the first few strokes are precisely even. This will ensure that the attack of the roll is clear and the pitch of the drum is heard. Another point to consider is that at any time you should be ready to begin a roll on either hand. Now, not so you can impress your friends, but if you need to roll from drum to drum, you'll be able to do so with an almost seamless transition. They don't feel that once you're in a roll that you can, can't adjust your roll speed to compensate. I do this all the time to accommodate drum to drum roll shifting. Here's an exercise that may be useful for this. Here's one I think is really good for controlling the shift during rolls from drum to drum. And be sure to strive for absolute evenness in both hands. Besides the normal loud or soft roll, there's the forte piano roll, which is nothing more than a loud attack followed by a subito soft roll. Now, this is achieved by a strong single note attack, waiting for the sound to somewhat die away, then sneaking in with a soft sustain. Remember that the strong single note attack should be a quality resonant tone. And that's it. Now that we've discussed how to roll, let's talk about when to roll, or more specifically, how to read the various notations of rolls. Now in my experience, many composers improperly notate rolls for not only the timpani, but also the full range of percussion instruments. It's your job as a timpanist or percussionist to be flexible in interpreting that notation. For example, if you've got a whole note roll in one measure and a quarter note release on beat one of the next measure, do you separate the roll and quarter note or do you tie them together? Well, in that situation, most of the time you tie them together. However, if the band or orchestra releases before the downbeat, then so should you. Another example might be if you've got a 4-4 four -four measure with four quarter notes, all with rolls notated, none of which are tied. Now, what do you do? There again, it depends on what the ensemble is doing. Are they holding across the measure, or are they re-articulating each quarter note? Even if they're holding across the measure, and you think you should do the same thing, well, the battery percussion might have four straight quarters across the bar. I'd probably go with what the percussion is doing. Now I'll play a couple of examples. The first will be without ties and the second will be with ties. Okay, one last point about rolls. Now you should be able to recognize the different notation styles for rolls. Now there's the typical American notation with the slashes across the stem or above the note, and the French notation that can be written out as a trill, or you might see a, a TR with a squiggly after it. Now both styles mean the same thing.
All right, now the most dreaded topic for most people, but the absolutely most important, tuning and intonation. Let's start with tuning. This is basically the method that you'll use to achieve whatever pitch is needed. Now, there are quite a few schools of thought on this matter. Now, I won't say which method is right or which is wrong, just which ones I prefer. And I should say that it's very important that while using any one of these methods that you need to start in the low register of the drum and pedal up to the desired pitch. This just assures that the head will be fully seated around the bowl. Okay, you've got to set the head into vibration so that you can hear the pitch of the drum. I use three of the four methods that I'll describe. First, there's the flick. Just a simple flick of the finger, great for times when you need to localize the sound, but not upset the people around you. It's much less annoying. A tapping with the finger, the second method, is a similar to the flick, but it results in a pitch that is a little harder to hear. The third would be the mallet tap. Just tap the head lightly enough to hear the pitch. The problem is you really can't tap light enough so as not to disturb anyone. Now the method of humming. This method can be useful if the drum is absolutely and clear at every spot around the head. Just hum the desired pitch into the head and if it's there, it'll hum right back at you. Now this is the method I most rarely use. My reason is simple. I'm not a vocalist. In fact, I'm downright terrible when it comes to vocalizing any pitch. Now, for the pitch source. A pitch pipe or a tuning fork can be used. But for someone with an undeveloped study of intervals, I'd recommend the pitch pipe. The problem with this is that over time, the pitch pipe loses its accuracy due to bent metal reeds. Or when overblown, the pitch can be distorted. It's also a noisy little thing. I think the most accurate method would be to develop your study of intervals to such a high degree of efficiency that any note can be attained by the use of a tuning fork. Another point I should mention, tuning gauges. What a great invention. However, I've seen far too often young and experienced players use this as a major crutch. Now, don't fall into the trap. Instead, use this to your advantage to develop your study of intervals. And remember, the gauges only get you in the ballpark. You must use your ears to determine whether or not adjustment is needed. This brings us to our last point before we get into some advanced techniques. Intonation and tuning. Every timpanist should be so well versed in the study of intervals that he or she is absolutely confident. Now, being able to tune up a set of intervals on timpani is what makes or breaks a timpanist. A timpanist that can't hear and tune intervals as well, like a baton twirler who can't see. And for those of you who don't have perfect pitch, you can attain many intervals by the simple recall of a few popular tunes and melodies. For example, if you want to tune a minor second, sing the Jaws theme. If you need to hear a perfect fifth, sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Get the point? If you'd like a complete listing of some popular melodies and corresponding intervals, you can find those on our website. Now let's talk briefly about considerations for loud playing. Now let's say you have a loud exposed roll and the drum's not a top quality instrument. Well, what happens to the pitch? Well, on a drum of loose mechanical construction, the pitch might have a tendency to go flat due to the lack of mechanical strength in the spider. On professional model timpani, the construction is of much better quality and durability. So what happens to the pitch? It'll actually tend to rise a bit. Now this is because the drum won't give mechanically, the head tightens, and the pitch goes up. Granted, we're only talking about microtonal increments, but when striving for perfection, nothing goes unchecked. Another point to consider is that ensemble's pitch in orchestras or bands is often changing. The stage and hall conditions affect the pitch of an ensemble, which means constant adjustments must be made in the pitch of the timpani. Now here's a quick rule of thumb for this. As the temperature in the hall gets warmer, the pitch of most ensembles will rise. And as the temperature gets cooler, the ensemble's pitch will go down. 
Now lastly, I'd like to say something on the topic of tuning and counting. Now, this for the beginning timpanist is probably one of the most challenging things to do. Accounting should become second nature so that you do it subconsciously. Now let's talk a bit about pedaling. Eventually you'll need to do a little or a lot of pedaling. Now listen to this exercise, and while I play, determine where the pedaling occurred and if it was necessary or not. If you said the pedaling was necessary, then you were mostly right. You could have put the D-flat on the 23-inch drum, however the sound of the 23-inch drum in this range is not so good. Now what I did instead was pedal the D-flat down to the C, just a half step, so that I wouldn't have to use the 23-inch drum. Now for the next one, there's no way around the pedaling. A total of six different pitches are used and well, most organizations find themselves lucky to have a set of four drums, much less five or six. And as I said before, a standard set consists of four timpani, sometimes five. What you just heard was the end of the last movement of Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique. Even in the pre-modern era of timpani writing, sticking had to be well thought out. Now, this excerpt written for two timpanists requires the player to either cross over or do some fancy doubling. Now, I opt for the crossing in this one. Not only does the player at all times need to be true to the rhythm in the most even of sound, but should also consider the nature of the art visually. A crossing, if executed properly, is certainly more visually stimulating but is the evenness sacrificed. Also, be careful not to accent the note following the cross unless specified by the composer. Now, for me, I usually try to avoid crossing. It requires more motion and really interrupts the proper stroke that we discussed earlier, resulting in a less than perfect tone. Another method of motion that can be used is the shifting method. Now, this can be a better option when the part being played is fast. It allows a proper stroke to the head compared to crossing at this speed. A disadvantage to keep in mind, as with crossing, is that as you perform the shift, there's a tendency to accent the note that follows the shift. Also, when making the shift, be sure to aim for the same beating spot and be vigilant about striking the drum with equal height of rise. A good example of shifting is found in Beethoven's Seventh Symphony. The difference here is that the music calls for an inflection to the second drum. A crossing can also be used in this excerpt. Here.
The last method of sticking I'll mention is the method of doubling. I use this method the least. However, there are times when doubling is unavoidable. Listen to this next excerpt. It's from Claude T. Smith's Festival Variations. To achieve even doubles, you really need to practice some various double sticking exercises. Keep in mind that good clean doubles need to sound like straight sticking, or as if one hand were to play all of the notes. Now here's an exercise I think can help you attain those perfect imperceptible doubles. The next two topics are not one and the same. They're actually two completely different subjects, dampening and muffling. The dampening has to do with a specific playing technique, and muffling, just a logistical matter. But first, let's talk about dampening. Dampening is a process which clears any ringing tones from interfering with other notes to follow. It's also necessary to utilize dampening to achieve a staccato sound or shorten the length of a note. But for the actual technique of dampening, Try placing your fingers on the head with just enough pressure to clear the sound, but not too much as to distort the pitch of the drum. Here, watch. Now let me demonstrate an exercise that I think will help you develop your dampening. Start by playing quarters across the two drums. Now dampen in a very rhythmic pulse to the beat. Now when that's perfected, move the dampening to the end of the beat, then to the A, uh, and finally to the E, and that's it. I'll tell you, if you can perfect this exercise, then dampening will become second nature. An important point to note is not to overdo it. Remember that sound quality is of the utmost importance. Dampening too quickly can result in nothing more than a noise with an unrecognizable pitch. Now muffling, or muting as some might call it, is nothing more than a way to keep the head from ringing, or humming inadvertently. And by placing a chamois cloth or felt square on the head approximately four to five inches from the rim, you can eliminate the chance of the head ringing when you don't want it. Now I use four round felt cut mutes which are hung from the edge of the drums. When I'm not playing on a specific drum, it's usually muted. Now this is not the only time you'll use something to mute the head. Occasionally, a composer will ask for a muted sound while actually playing. A Borodin's Polovetsian Dances is a great example of this. The composer actually writes for a muted ostinato, which sounds like this. Now, what he was after was a very dry, rhythmically prominent sound. The same ostinato is used earlier with the snare drum acting as the ensemble's metronome. Now, for the positioning of the mute, the best place is smack dab in the middle of the head so that the muting is evenly distributed to all tension rods. The last topic we'll discuss is mallet selection. And by mallet selection, I mean knowing which hardness or weight of mallet to use. Also, what type of shafts and core should be used? Well, since this is such a subjective topic and there are so many different views, I'll give you a few things to ponder and let you make your own determinations. 
The key point to remember is blend. Now, I believe that every tympanist should supply themselves with a fairly expansive set of mallets of varying degrees of hardness and weight. And when I perform, I use a set of 10 pairs of mallets. Some are actually very similar in hardness, yet differ significantly in weight. Now, here's an example of that. Now, one is quite a bit lighter than the other, yet virtually the same hardness. Now, they really come in handy at those times when you need to rhythmically cut through the ensemble. Also, it's very important to remember that soft sticks are not just for playing softly. Just as in triangle playing, one type of mallet can be used for numerous effects. For example, you can use a soft mallet for loud passages. Remember the point of blend and tone? It's your job as a timpanist to support the ensemble, not have the ensemble support you, however nice that may sound. Now, sometimes you'll find that the timpani aren't cutting through rhythmically. Often this has to do with the acoustical properties of the venue. Now feel free to change to a one or even two degrees harder mallet to accommodate the muddiness of a hall. Having traveled and performed in more than 500 venues, I rarely play with the same mallets I used in initial rehearsals. And with the selection of mallets in mind, I'd recommend starting with a softer mallet and forcing the articulation by way of technique rather than allowing the harder stick to do all the work for you. Well, I hope this segment helps you become more aware of the tonal possibilities of the timpani. And remember that those who strive for perfection will attain it quicker than those who don't. We really enjoyed putting this video together for you. We hope this information will help you continue to develop your skills with concert percussion instruments and help you to enjoy them even more. From the United States Army Field Band Percussion Section, we salute you. Hi, I'm Staff Sergeant Steve Owen. The snare drum is central to a drummer's education. The techniques I'm going to talk to you about apply to all of the other instruments in the percussion family. I'll be taking you through my philosophy of snare drumming step by step, covering grip, stroke, posture, rebound, ornaments, and an overall concept of sound. Most importantly, I'm going to show you how to be relaxed when you play 
Relaxation is the key to feeling and sounding good during a performance. A wiser man than I once said that good drumming is a combination of total control and total relaxation. That should be our goal, no matter which instrument we're playing. The proper snare drum grip is crucial to the success of any percussionist. While everyone's arms, hands, and fingers are different, the essentials of grip are pretty much universal. It's really important to insist on good basics when you're first starting out, because that's when bad habits can form. And we all know how hard it can be to drop a bad habit once we've picked it up. The fulcrum, or point of balance, is the basis of snare drum technique. The fulcrum is the place where the contact between the hand and the stick is the most focused. A precise point of balance is needed to allow for the maximum mobility of the stick. If you grip the stick like a club, you won't be able to execute even the most basic snare drum techniques. The best placement of the fulcrum is between the pad of the thumb and the first knuckle of the index finger. The thumb joint should be depressed toward the stick rather than locked outward so as to avoid any unnecessary tension. The remaining fingers wrap gently around the stick for support. The back finger shouldn't squeeze the stick, but should remain in contact. The length of the stick will determine exactly where to place the fulcrum, but a good rule of thumb is to allow about three quarters of an inch to remain visible behind the hand. Experiment a little, but remember that choking up too much will put all of the weight at the back of the stick, keeping the stick from rebounding and choking up too little will put all of the weight at the bead, resulting in a dead stroke. I rotate my palms downward to face the floor. That allows my wrists the maximum amount of flexibility. The sticks should form a V position on the drum head. The angle of the V is between 45 and 90 degrees. The key is that it will feel natural. The general beating spot on a concert snare drum is about an inch off center. The center of the head is a dead spot and about two to three inches in diameter. The area of the head between the general beating spot and the far edge can be used for dynamic shading. The drum should be at a height that allows your upper arms to hang loosely and naturally by your sides. A drum that's too low will force you to assume a kind of slump-shouldered posture, and a drum that's too high will force you to chicken wing out your arms to avoid hitting the rim. Either way, you're bound to experience discomfort while you play. A good rule of thumb is that the forearms should be slightly less than parallel to the floor while you're playing. To compensate for that, it's possible to set up the drum so that it's angled slightly away from you. That will ensure that the bead of the stick is making good, flush contact with the playing surface. Also, remember to set up the drum so that the snares run perpendicular to your body. That way, the optimal playing surface is always directly over the snares. It's always a good idea to use a full-length mirror to observe your playing position. If anything looks or feels unnatural, double-check the fundamentals of grip and posture to make sure everything is okay. I know I sound like a broken record, but bad posture can lead to fatigue or injury, so don't let it creep into your playing. When I play single notes, the stroke comes exclusively from the wrist. Try this, with the forearms completely stationary, just lift the tip of the stick and drop it, allowing it to rebound naturally to the starting point. The motion should be smooth and unforced. If it helps, think about bouncing a ball. The bead of the stick strikes the head and then bounces back up. Remember to keep the wrist relaxed. The distance that the bead of the stick is lifted away from the head is called the height of rise. The height of rise is important for the volume of the stroke, the speed of the passage, ornaments, phrasing, and so on. In other words, it's all about the height of rise. Learning to control the height of rise and get it nice and equal in both hands is a matter that requires daily practice, even for advanced players. Check out these exercises for developing the wrist stroke. Remember to start slowly and be methodical. Try to create a flowing legato style. That will give you the warmest, most appealing sound. 
strive for an accurate beating spot. Always practice with a metronome to ensure good time and acuity of rhythm. Whenever you can, use a mirror to make sure that your arms aren't moving around and that your height of rise is perfectly even in both hands. If you have the means, record your practice sessions so you can listen for imperfections. Being strict with your fundamentals is always helpful, but it's especially important when you're first starting out. There are a lot of things that give a piece of music its personality. Accents are at the top of the list for music written for percussion instruments. So many of the influences for drummers, African music, Brazilian music, jazz and rock music, have enormous rhythmic drive, and accents are part of the reason why that music is so fascinating. Listen to the next piece of music. We're going to play it twice. The first time, we're going to leave out the accents. Then, we'll put them back in. I think you'll hear a pretty big difference. Executing accents is all about controlling the height of rise. Not only do you need to play accented strokes higher, but it is also really important to play the unaccented notes lower. You're trying to create contrast, trying to set the really important notes apart from the notes that are just accompaniment. As you study the following exercises, remember to keep the unaccented notes very low and even while playing a big, full stroke for the accents.
Many of the standard 26 American rudiments can also be used for developing accents, such as the paradiddle, the double paradiddle, the paradiddle diddle, and so on. Also, a player can sometimes add accents on strong beats, even when they aren't written in the part. Those are called agogic accents and can help the music feel more natural. If the part is written, you might play because it sounds more organic. Remember to practice accents in soft passages, too. Take all of the exercises we're presenting and play them at a variety of dynamic levels and tempos. If you're really going to make music, you'll need to develop the tools to deal with lots of different technical demands. Once you've gotten the hang of the wrist stroke, you can begin experimenting with a subtle whipping motion. Try elevating the wrist slightly before executing the accent and then whipping the tip of the stick into the playing surface. Like with the wrist stroke, the motion is smooth and unforced. As you can see, it's just another way of setting the height of rise of the accented notes apart from the inner notes. This technique may help you increase the tempo of many passages without tensing up. You'll probably notice me using this technique frequently as I demonstrate things. It's something I feel comfortable with. You can try it, and if it's not working, go back to the pure wrist stroke. All successful musicians practice long tones. Percussionists are no exception. The difficulty is that on many percussion instruments, especially the snare drum, sustained sounds are contrary to the articulate nature of the instrument. So how do you produce a long tone? The idea is to play a series of individual attacks that are so close together and so even that the listener is fooled into hearing a single sustained sound. It's like sleight of hand. In the interest of staying relaxed, try to create as much sound with as little motion as possible. Relaxed control is the key. Remember always to think legato. There are three types of rolls. The first one we all learn is the single stroke roll, where you simply alternate strokes as quickly and evenly as you can. That technique works well for instruments that have a long decay, like timpani, suspended cymbal, or bass drum. Rolls on the snare drum require the use of one of the two types of rolls that employ rebound. Let's take a look at those two types of rolls and some concepts and techniques to help develop them. When a brass player holds a note, he tries to make the richest, darkest, most beautiful sound he can. We drummers should have the same goal. A roll should be smooth, warm, and seamless. If you pinch the stick and force the roll, it sounds like this. Not too pleasant, is it? The key to a good roll is fattening up the rebound strokes. I do that by performing the techniques in slow motion so I can focus in on each hand and get them really even. The first type of snare drum roll is commonly called the open roll. It's also known as the rudimental roll, the military roll, the double stroke roll. You get the idea. This is the type of roll used in marching band and drum corps. It consists of a single arm motion and a single rebound stroke, so each motion yields two notes. The sound is open and articulate. I think of it as a machine gun sound, very focused and mechanical. The second type of roll is the closed roll. It's also called the orchestral roll or the concert roll. This is the type of roll used for concert style music, be it in a symphony orchestra or a wind ensemble. It consists of a single arm motion and several rebound strokes. The resulting articulation is smooth and seamless.
Okay, let's talk about technique. The technique for the roll has three parts, arm motion, dipping motion, and finger control. First, I use a loose arm motion to add a little extra weight to the stroke. The second part is a very subtle dipping motion with the wrists, which increases the amount of time that the bead of the stick remains in contact with the playing surface. Lastly, I use my middle finger to pull upward on the shaft of the stick to control the rebound and make inner bounces. Those three motions flow together in a natural legato technique, and that can take some time to master. The benefit is that your roll will sound full and dark, even on a very articulate drum. I'll play a long roll. Check out the technique from several angles and see if you can identify the three parts as they flow together. Here are a few exercises for developing the roll. Remember to stay relaxed and take your time. The muscles and tendons used to control rebound are very small, and it will take a while to build them up. The key to a soft roll is slowing down the hand motion and equalizing the spread from both sticks. Try the 9-8 exercise from before at a softer dynamic, or try the following.
You should also be very familiar with the so-called metered rolls, such as five-stroke rolls, seven-stroke rolls, and nine-stroke rolls. These are listed in the standard 26 American rudiments and should be learned both open and closed. As a percussionist, you will encounter metered rolls every day, so know them at a variety of tempos and dynamic levels. When you approach ornaments, such as flams, drags, and four-stroke roughs, keep one important concept in mind. Ornaments are just decoration and should remain subservient to the main note or bass rhythm. Always play them softer than the primary notes so as to avoid detracting from the essence of the phrase or creating confusion about the meter. Always play instead of The most basic ornament is the flam. When executing a flam, think carefully about the height of rise for each stick. The main note should have a height of rise commensurate with the prevailing dynamic of the passage. The grace note should come up only a tiny fraction of that distance. The grace note will always sound first by virtue of starting out so much closer to the head. The grace note and the main note should sound very close together, but not simultaneously. When the sticks accidentally hit at the same time, you get a popped flam, and you don't want that. Keeping the grace note low feels a little unnatural at first, but be patient and work it out. When you play a passage that requires numerous flams, you need to use the back fingers to control the rebound. That will prevent the grace note from having too much height of rise. Any flam rudiment will serve as an example. Take the flam accent. If you isolate each hand, you can hear what each stick needs to do in order to ensure good, clean execution. As you can see, using back fingers to control the rebound is necessary in order to get the rhythm to be clear. Some percussionists refer to this technique as the downstroke, and that's fine just so long as you don't interpret it as meaning play into the head. Remember to stay relaxed and just use a little back finger for support. The single drag, or rough, should be thought of like a flam, except instead of one grace note, the ornament consists of a longer sound. Although the drag is written as two distinct notes, it is traditionally interpreted as a short, closed buzz stroke. Think of the word zat, and you should have a good idea of how a single drag should sound. Remember the little note, big note concept, 
and keep the ornament softer than the main note. Some conductors like the single drag to be played as two distinct notes. So practice them that way too. The four-stroke rough consists of a main note preceded by three grace notes. Unlike the single drag, the ornament in a four-stroke rough is traditionally played as three distinct notes. To render the articulation, it's helpful to play the ornament hand-to-hand, -hand, either right-left-right-left -left -left or left-right-left-right. -left -right. The grace notes should be very fast and very close to the main note, and that can take a lot of practice. Here's an exercise to help you develop that technique. Some percussionists like to stick a four-stroke rough right, left, left, right, or left, right, right, left. I find this sticking especially effective when the dynamic of a passage is mezzo piano or below. As you work it out, remember that your goal is to create shape and direction toward the main note. Here are some exercises for you to try.
Take a listen to the following etude that incorporates the three basic types of ornaments. Notice that the main notes and bass rhythms are always distinct, regardless of the ornaments or dynamic marking. Hi, my name is Sergeant First Class Bill Elliott. In this segment, we are going to explore the triangle, tambourine, bass drum, crash cymbals, suspended cymbal, and bass drum cymbal attachment. When I was in junior high and high school, most of the percussion parts were what I call boom chick or oom um pa. The bass drum and cymbals typically played on one and three, and the snare drum played on two and four. Now, composers and arrangers write challenging percussion parts from the elementary through the college levels, utilizing many of the techniques we will discuss. Let's briefly talk about the description and selection of the triangle. The first thing we need is the proper equipment. A good triangle clip is made of metal or wood and should easily clip to a music stand. It should be strung with two loops of a thin cord, preferably nylon. Thicker materials tend to dampen the overtones. I use two loops so one can act as a backup if the other breaks. For triangle beaters, you should have a selection that vary in size. The same holds true for triangles because they measure anywhere from 3 to 9 inches in size. Although the average triangle measures 6 to 8 inches, you can see that there are many different sizes which vary in sound. The key word here is sound. What determines the sound that you ultimately pick? It could be your personal preference, the conductor's preference, or simply the demands of your music. 
In the early stages of a student's development, he or she will need some guidance in selecting the proper instrument for the music. For example, most students will pick a small triangle for soft passages and a larger triangle for louder passages. Dynamics should not be the determining factor in the selection of your instrument. You can play a larger triangle just as softly as a smaller one. So my question to you is, what is the difference in their sounds? The smaller triangle gives you a brighter sound, not necessarily a softer sound, and a larger triangle gives you a darker sound, not necessarily a louder sound. So what determines your sound? I think it's the brightness or darkness of sound that you want. How do we hold the triangle? Allow your thumb and first finger of your hand to form the shape of a C. The clip should then drop into the C and rest on top. Now that we have the triangle suspended, let's discuss playing areas and techniques for slow to moderate rhythmic passages. Make sure you hold the triangle beater at a 45 degree angle for maximum overtones. For maximum resonance and fullness in sound, strike the triangle on the inside of the bass near the closed end. or on the outside near the bottom, or the top. In my travels with the Army Field Band, I have found that not every school can afford to have a selection of triangles. However, even with one triangle, you have a selection of more than one sound. Here, listen as I strike the triangle on the closed side near the top. Now listen to the inside of the bass near the closed in. Can you hear the difference? Listen again. Which sound is darker? If you said the inside of the bass near the end, you are correct. It does give you a darker sound. The outside near the top gives you a brighter sound. Now let's take a look at two techniques for faster rhythmic passages. The first is a legato technique in which we play the triangle with one beater. We do so by placing the beater inside the triangle and moving it back and forth between the two sides. Remember to keep the beater at a 45 degree angle whenever you play. This is possible when you play between the bass and the close side of the triangle, which gives you the fullest sound possible. If you use the top of the triangle closest to the clip, it is difficult to play using a 45 degree angle. Therefore, you sacrifice a full sound for a thinner sound. Here is an exercise to help you practice this technique. Notice that the sticking I used for the exercise is consistent, like the straight system of sticking that we utilize for the snare drum. All of the ones and the ands should be on one side while the e's and the uhs are the other side. Remember we do this for a consistent sound and stable rhythm. That particular technique works well, but it has its faults. Although it allows us to keep the instrument up, it's not as stable as suspending the triangle from two clips with the closed side on the top and playing with a pair of matched beaters. Remember, what looks good doesn't always sound good, and what sounds good doesn't always look good. Having the triangle suspended from two clips playing on the closed side, or suspending the triangle from one clip playing on the bass, or on opposite sides at the top with a pair of matched beaters is the most stable way of articulating fast rhythmic passages. To practice these techniques, let's utilize the same exercise as before, but play all the ones and the ands with the right hand and all the e's and the uhs with the left hand.
Having the triangle suspended with one or two clips is the most reliable method for playing grace notes. This time I will suspend the triangle from one clip and play on its base with two match beaters like this. Remember, all grace note figures should be played utilizing single strokes. The definition of a role for all percussion instruments is to create a smooth, sustained sound. I have found over the years that the first definition of a role that we come up with is to play as fast as humanly possible. By doing this, we do not achieve that smooth, sustained sound that we are looking for. Instead, we get a choke sound where we hear each individual attack of the beater on the triangle. When rolling, think of slowing the speed of the roll down enough to allow that particular instrument to resonate to its maximum potential. Listen to the difference in the two rolls we just talked about. First, the fastest possible roll. Now, I will slow the roll down. Hear the difference? I thought you would. Notice when I rolled on the triangle, I placed the beater between the base and the close side at a 45 degree angle. You can also place the beater between the two sides at the top. Remember, this sounds different because we lose the angle of the beater. Listen. Another way of rolling is to suspend the triangle the way we did for fast articulate passages. Remember, we suspend the triangle with two clips and play on the closed side, or we can suspend the triangle from one clip playing on the base or on opposite sides at the top with a pair of matched beaters utilizing a single stroke roll to create a smooth, sustained sound. The music you are playing will determine the roll technique that you will use. Listen to the triangle excerpt from the Overture to Candide. Steve will play it with one beater and I will play it with two beaters mounted. Tell me which of the techniques would be more appropriate for that particular excerpt. If you pick the second way, the one with two beaters, you would be right. If you pick the first one, you would be right as well. Although the first way is much more challenging to achieve a difference between the articulation of the rhythm and the roll. The last technique I want to discuss is dampening. A general rule for dampening the triangle is to let everything ring unless there are obvious unison staccato notes. Always listen and emulate the musical interpretation of the ensemble. We dampen the triangle by squeezing the remaining three fingers of the holding hand into the heel of the hand. Watch. Other patterns that require dampening are groove patterns. These patterns can be used in commercial styles of music. The first pattern is an open quarter note followed by two closed eighth notes. Listen. Our final pattern is even eighth notes closed while using open sounds for the sewn clave rhythm. This time, instead of hanging the triangle from a clip, hold it in your hand like this. It has a more percussive articulation and it is easier to dispose of when getting another instrument. Listen. The tambourine is a frame drum with two different sounding parts, the head and the jingles. 
Tambourines come in varying sizes, but the standard size is about 10 inches in diameter. Let's look at a selection of tambourines. Tambourines can have single or double rows of jingles. Some jingles are stacked on top of each other, like this, and others have what we call staggered rows. The shell should be lightweight to allow easy movement and to permit an acceptable vibration. You can grip the instrument with either hand. Place your thumb on the top rim and let the fingers wrap around the shell under the head, like a baseball grip. A muffled timbre can be produced by placing the thumb on the head or the fingers on the bottom of the head. The unique thing about the tambourine is that the speed and volume are restricted when playing with one hand. Different dynamics and tempos greatly affect tambourine techniques. So we will discuss the different techniques by dynamics and tempo. A note to our music educators out there before introducing these techniques. Give the students the different scenarios and see what they come up with on their own. This allows the student to explore and allows you to find out a little more about the student's creative thought process. The first technique we will cover is for loud and slow rhythmic passages. Angle is very important to all tambourine technique. Hold the tambourine at a 45 degree angle about shoulder height. Why a 45 degree angle instead of 90 or flat? Let's listen to the difference. At a 90 degree angle, listen to how long the jingles vibrate. Extra vibrations also occur when holding the instrument flat. By holding it at a 45 degree angle, you get a short decay which allows you to articulate your slow rhythms at a louder dynamic more clearly. Notice the way I struck the tambourine. I bunched my fingers together to form a flat surface and played over the rim. This gives me the best jingle resonance. If I want more attack, I can play with my fist or an open hand on the center of the head. What if we want to play a slow rhythmic passage but at a softer dynamic level? The obvious thing is to strike the instrument with less force to create a softer sound. Is there something else we can do to get even softer? What happens to my sound if I place the heel of my hand on the head of the tambourine and extend my fingers to the edge and strike? Can you hear the difference between the two? By placing the heel of my hand on the center of the head, we eliminate the head sound, creating a thinner texture and a softer sound. The most common technique used for fast and loud rhythmic passages is going back and forth between the hand and the knee. Make sure the hand and the knee are striking the center of the head and not the rim. Be able to do this with the head facing up or down. I say this for a reason. If you can only do this technique with the head down, what happens if someone plays the instrument before you and leaves it on the table with the head up? There is no way you can turn the tambourine over without making a sound. So as you practice this technique, practice it both ways. We can use the same exercise for triangle to help us on the tambourine. We will change the rights and the lefts with hands and knees. Remember, the sticking for the, this exercise is like the straight system of sticking for the snare drum. All the ones and the ands are played with the hand, and all the es and the uhs are played with the knee, or vice versa. This achieves a consistent sound and a stable rhythm. Now, let's play the exercise.
Another technique for a fast rhythmic passage at a louder dynamic is to make an up-down motion with the holding hand. Let's take our exercise and put in this different motion or sticking. Our two sixteenths and an eighth rhythm will be up, down, tap. Watch. The eighth and two sixteenths pattern is tap, up, down. Listen to this pattern. Consecutive sixteenth notes can be done several different ways. The first way is tap, tap, up, down. Or it can be done up, down, tap, tap. Or it can be done tap, up, down, tap. I will use the first pattern as I demonstrate this exercise. The first time I used this technique was on Leonard Bernstein's Slava. In his band arrangement, there is a 7-8 tambourine part. Using the hand-knee technique was difficult going from the rhythm to the roll and back again. So I played the part like this. Using this technique allows us to keep the instrument at shoulder height and gives the music an easy, elegant feel. Now let's say we want to play a fast rhythmic passage at a soft dynamic level. Remember, a key to playing softer is to eliminate the head sound. We can do this by laying the tambourine on the knee or a padded trap table with the head facing down and play with the fingers of both hands like this. You can also lay the tambourine on the knee with the head facing up. Make sure the knee is in the center of the head so you can retain the 45 degree angle and play with the fingers of both hands. Use more fingers for louder passages. Use fewer fingers for softer passages. How do you play grace notes on the tambourine? For fast and soft grace notes, we can lay the tambourine on the leg and single stroke all the grace notes like this. For fast and loud grace notes, you can use the hand-knee technique like this. We can also use the up-down method for our grace notes. A flam would be executed by leading the fingers and following through with the heel of the hand. I'll demonstrate. The three-stroke rough would be done with the up-down for the grace notes and a tap for the release. Again, I'll demonstrate. The four stroke rough would be done with a tap up down for the grace notes and a tap for the release. Now listen to the exercise in its entirety. Roll techniques on the tambourine are also greatly influenced by dynamics. We use a shake roll for rolls that are mezzo forte and louder, and for soft rolls that are long in duration as well as for rapid, rhythmic, or ostinato passages. 
Starting and stopping the rolls with a head tap according to ensemble articulation is a common practice. Occasionally, no head tap is necessary. To do a shake roll, you can hold the tambourine in either hand. Rotate your wrist in the same manner as left hand traditional grip for snare drum, or the executing of a one-handed marimba roll. Let's listen to how this sounds. Another way of shake rolling which takes a little edge off the sound is to rotate the wrist in the same manner as the left hand traditional grip for snare drum. Simultaneously add a slight forward backward wrist motion in the same manner as match grip to create a fluid circular motion. Listen as Scott demonstrates. For soft rolls of long duration, hold the tambourine alongside the leg. The jingle should be light, bright, and delicate for extremely long rolls. Keeping the instrument down reduces the volume by using your surroundings to muffle the sound. For extremely loud rolls, you can use two tambourines. One example of this could be Holst the Planet's Jupiter. When the ensemble is playing fortissimo, sometimes two tambourines are needed to cut through. Listen to this excerpt using two tambourines. Notice you can't use your hand for the head tap to start and stop the roll because you have an instrument in each hand. Instead, you can use your forearms. Now let's go to rolls that are soft and short in duration. For this kind of roll, we use the thumb or the finger. We do this by moving the thumb or the finger along the edge of the tambourine. The rapid bouncing causes the jingles to vibrate. To get friction between the head and or the thumb of the finger, a player can either dampen the finger or rub bass rosin or beeswax on the head of the tambourine to create a sticky surface to facilitate the bouncing effect. I prefer bass rosin or beeswax for several different reasons. First, if I'm on stage in my uniform or a tuxedo in front of a lot of people, the last thing I want to be doing is licking my fingers as if I just finished eating a bucket of fried chicken. The second reason is for playing an ostinato pattern that continues for a long period of time. For example, if I dampen my finger, the moisture will only last for a short duration, and there's no way you can dampen your finger again without interrupting the time. Watch. Therefore, bass rosin or beeswax is your best choice. Notice on the last rhythmic passage I played, the release of the roll was articulated by dropping the heel of the hand down to articulate the release. Watch again. Now watch how to execute the release of the roll when using your thumb. Notice that you have to turn the wrist in order to get the heel of the hand over to articulate the release. Watch again. The release of the roll can also be articulated by using the thumb or the forefinger. Watch as I demonstrate the thumb first. Now the forefinger. One final note, for the longer thumb and finger rolls, try using a larger tambourine, perhaps 12 inches in diameter. This gives you a larger surface for the thumb to travel across, allowing you to sustain a longer roll. A standard size for a concert bass drum is 36 inches in diameter by 16 inches in width. The types of materials for heads are fiber skin, which is a man-made textured plastic, or calf skin, which is a natural animal hide. 
Smooth heads create a very brittle tone, therefore should be avoided in a concert setting. When tuning the bass drum, the playing head should be a fourth or fifth above, below, or at the same pitch as the resonating head. I like to start with the playing head and get it to a response that feels good to me. Make sure it's not too loose or floppy so that it is articulate and resonant. Then I take the resonating head and put it at the same pitch as the playing head for a starting point. Remember, the resonating head determines how articulate the sound will be. Again, it can be anywhere from a perfect fifth above or below the playing head. You have to determine what sound you want. Let's take a look at a general mallet selection and some effects mallets. The first one to look at is a general beater. It is a medium to large headed felt mallet that produces a well-rounded resonant tone. Next is a pair of rolling beaters. As you can see, these are smaller than the general beaters and are easier to control. The last beater to fill out our general selection is a set of staccato beaters. Staccato beaters are similar to rollers but have less felt and a harder core. These are used for articulating rhythmic figures. Some other effects mallets that we use are wooden beaters that we use for extremely articulate playing, especially in a soft dynamic range. Another is a hard felt beater that we use for extremely articulate playing in loud dynamic ranges. General playing areas for the bass drum are the same as any membranophone. The center of the drum is used for loud strokes and extremely articulate passages. Off center or a third of the distance from the rim is used for all general playing and loud rolls. The edge is for soft rolls and special effects that require a thin sound and higher overtones. The forearm and wrist produce the general playing stroke. Soft strokes are produced mostly by the wrist. Adding the upper arm to the general stroke produces loud strokes. The direct stroke goes directly into the head with a flicking of the wrist to terminate the stroke. This produces maximum vibrations and overtones from the drum. For rolls, we use two matched beaters. If your bass drum is suspended and can lay flat, you can use match grip to execute a single stroke roll. If your bass drum does not lay flat, then hold the beaters with traditional grip and still use single strokes to execute the roll. To dampen is to stop the vibrations of the head by exerting pressure with the left hand or right knee. The most significant problem to address is not how to dampen, but when to dampen. Most composers and arrangers are not always familiar with proper techniques and notation of the bass drum. The note values are not always consistent with the band or orchestra. Therefore, a player must listen and reinterpret the written part. Another option is to check the full score for the proper note values as shown on your screen. How and when do we muffle the bass drum? To muffle it is to partially mute the head to lessen the vibrations. We muffle when the type of notation is fast. We also muffle if the character of the music is short or if there is a smaller instrumentation or if the acoustics of the hall are very live. All of these situations require muffling.
A standard pair of cymbals is usually 18 inches in size and has a quick response to vibrations. These are generally used when a cymbal part has a combination of loud and soft strokes and rhythmic passages. There are different types or sounds of cymbals. The first type of sound is French. These cymbals are thin and have lower overtones with a quick response and a fast decay. Next is the German type of sound. These are thicker and have a brilliant sound with a slower response and slower decay. Another type of sound is the Viennese. These are great all-purpose cymbals and fall in between the French and German sound, still having a quick response and fast decay. It is a good idea to have a smaller pair of cymbals on hand in order to have a better control for softer, more delicate passages. Understand that smaller cymbals create a thinner texture. To hold the cymbals, the index finger and the thumb curl around the strap nearest to the bell of the cymbal. The strap lays in the palm and the other three fingers wrap around the strap just like the match grip for snare drum. Now that we know how to hold the cymbals, let's learn how to put them together to produce a good sound. The top cymbal should hang down like a suspended cymbal, but at a slight angle. The bottom cymbal should face upward at a slight angle, resting on the knuckles of the hand. The two cymbals should set naturally at a slight angle to each other. The top cymbal is then dropped down onto the bottom cymbal. Both cymbals should be in motion for the best timbre. The impact causes the cymbals to pull apart from each other, then suspend the cymbals after the crash and let them resonate. To avoid air pockets or when no sound occurs, remember to drop the cymbal straight down and not at a glance. For loud and fast cymbal strokes, use a general crash stroke, but reduce the angle to 45 degrees. The cymbal should be kept close together to be ready for the next crash. For soft cymbal strokes, hold the cymbals at about 5 degree angle to the left of straight up and down. Separate the cymbals with the edge of the bottom cymbal above the edge of the top cymbal. Drop the top cymbal by pushing downward with the thumb and the forefinger, then pull apart after impact. To dampen the cymbals, bring them into the abdomen. Some of us have been blessed with better dampening mechanisms than others. This might be a consideration when assigning parts. A forte piano effect can be accomplished by dampening only one cymbal. The dampening rules for inconsistent note values on bass drum also apply to cymbals. Some parts indicate a need to dampen, although the tempo and note values may not allow for this. Suspended cymbals are usually smaller and thinner than crash cymbals. The standard size, which respond very quickly when struck with a mallet, is usually 16 to 18 inches in diameter. Smaller cymbals are better choice for soft, delicate passages, as well as fast crescendos and diminuendos.
Larger symbols are used for more of a sustained sound. We can suspend a symbol one of two ways. Either hang it by its strap from a boom stand, which allows the symbol to vibrate freely, or the symbol can be placed on a regular symbol stand for maximum control. The best mallets for suspended symbol are soft wound yarn or cord mallets, which allow the symbol to respond quickly and bring out all the overtones. When a composition calls for timpani mallets, always substitute these instead. Other implements for the suspended symbol include snare drum sticks, triangle beaters, and brushes. Strokes are always made on the edge of the symbol unless otherwise specified in the score. When playing a single note, strike opposite edges of the symbol simultaneously. That will cause the instrument to speak instantly and prevent the sound from blooming late. A roll can easily be controlled by placing the mallets on the edge at a 4 and 8 o'clock position. When rolling with mallets, use a single stroke roll. Remember, the definition of a roll is a smooth, sustained sound. The roll speed will vary according to the symbol size and thickness. A slower roll speed may be used for a roll that is long in duration. For rolls that crescendo for a short duration, a faster roll speed may be required. When rolling with snare drum sticks, utilize a buzz roll on the edge of the cymbal. Some additional effects call for different areas of the cymbal to be struck, scraped, or rubbed by triangle beaters, coins, and a bass bow. For example, a sizzle effect can be obtained by holding a thin triangle beater on the cymbal and then striking the cymbal with another mallet. A bass drum and cymbal combination can be very challenging and a lot of fun. Some of the repertoire calls for it, and other times we may use it in absence of another player. Hold the cymbal with the thumb and the index finger. Let the fingers wrap around the strap and push the top cymbal into the attached cymbal. For louder playing, use a larger cymbal on top. For softer playing, use a smaller cymbal on top. To dampen, bring the top cymbal into the chest and grab the attached cymbal with the right hand. Dampen or muffle the bass drum with the right knee. Now listen as I dampen all the instruments at once. Hi, we're the percussion section of the United States Army Field Band, Washington, D.C., the musical ambassadors of the Army. In this video, we are going to explore the wonderful sounds and techniques of concert percussion instruments, beginning to advanced. Our goal is to help you on your journey in becoming better musicians. We hope this video is as educational for you as it was for us to make.